People often wonder, what did Jesus look like? How tall was he? Did he have a beard? How long was his hair? Well, we actually have all the answers. He was around 5 foot 11, he had a beard and shoulder length hair, and his blood type was AB positive. Wait, what? exclaimed the cringe gay iconoclasts. How do you know all that? Well, we have the Shroud of Turin. The Shroud of Turin is a linen cloth that is believed by some to be the actual burial shroud of Jesus Christ. The shroud is a picture, if you will, it is an image that is blasted, to use a layman's term, on this burial cloth. This is the most studied archaeological object in the history of the world. Say that again for people. The most studied archaeological object in the history of the world. Okay. That was kind of silly. The Shroud of Turin is certainly not 100% proven, and there are a few iconoclasts who aren't gay. But that being said, the Shroud is certainly not a silly cheap fake, or an obvious ridiculous Catholic pipe dream. Whether or not you're convinced of the Shroud's authenticity, there can be no denying that it's an incredible object and a fascinating subject. If you read atheist blog posts or do any cursory research, the first thing they'll always say is that the Shroud of Turin was disproved, debunked, debunked by carbon dating. This is pretty much stated as fact most of the time, but the real facts of the matter are that it's a lot more complicated than they make it out to be. Since the original 1988 carbon dating research was published, it has been called into question by no less than six peer-reviewed journals, as well as a ton of other sources. Basically how this worked was they sent tiny samples of cloth into three separate labs, Oxford, Arizona, and Zurich. Basically, by a special method of destroying the sample, they are able to estimate the age by analyzing the chemical makeup, specifically of the carbon. That was a horrible summary of carbon dating, but the chemistry of all that is not really the point here. The point is that it came out with a date for the Shroud of around the 12th or the 13th century, over a millennium after the Shroud is supposed to have originated. At first, this seemed to put a hole in any case for the Shroud's authenticity. But since then, a lot of things have come to light that demonstrate this dating process to have been far from reliable. Firstly, each of the three samples provided different ages within that range, indicating that they were not all from the same time. Furthermore, each sample's location and age are related. In other words, the one over here is slightly younger than the one further in, and that one is younger than the one most towards the center. Taking the average of the three, then, doesn't actually really make sense. It would be much more logical to determine from this that the further towards center you go, the older the fabric is. Now, there's a couple of possible reasons for this. It could be that they were dating contaminants by accident, and little pieces of newer stuff was mixed in with the sample. Secondly, the samples may have been taken from a patch that was added in later centuries, as the shroud has been damaged and repaired a lot. As a matter of fact, those stained looking things on the shroud are patches from a different time that it was salvaged from a fire. And these theories do make sense, because the chemical makeup of that corner has been shown to be slightly different, and the weight distribution of that corner is different than in the rest of the shroud. According to Raymond Rogers, the director of the Shroud of Churn Research Project, he actually could see cotton fibers in the sample of the supposedly linen shroud, indicating that the sample consisted largely of newer patch material. I mean, that being said, maybe Rogers was just lying or making this up. I didn't know him. I can't vouch for his character. But that does make you at least a little less confident in the carbon dating, doesn't it? Now, my initial question was, why don't they just try again with a main or part of the shroud? Well, as it turns out, carbon dating actually destroys the thing that it's dating. Those samples that they took were annihilated. It's one of the most precious religious relics we have. Do you really think the Catholic Church would give permission to take a chunk out of the image of Jesus? Besides, carbon dating is expensive, and most of the mainstream scientific community would not be willing to fund it because we did it once, we don't need to do it again. And keep in mind, the scientists really are often in this for the grant money. I mean, understandable, it's how they make a living. Lots of cash went into the researchers who could headline, Radio Carbon shows that Shroud is a medieval fake. Not so much investment in, we tried it again and the results are not definitive. So if radio carbon dating isn't solid, is there any reason to not accept the Shroud's authenticity? Well, there's several more arguments left on both sides of the issue. For one thing, there's the anatomy. Lots of anatomists argue that the Shroud portrays a man with artistic gothic proportions, not realistic ones. And honestly, it is really hard to get to the bottom of this particular claim. Some anatomists say it's plausible, and well within the normal human range of proportions. Others claim the opposite. I don't really know. I'm not a doctor or an anatomist. But all in all, I've heard pretty good arguments that it can be explained with Jesus' not entirely flat position, and sometimes perhaps not average proportions that are still within standard deviation. I don't know. Some people do have pretty long arms. There's also the argument that the lack of historical records surrounding the Shroud before the 14th century indicate it didn't really exist before that. However, the idea of the story is that the Shroud was hidden, kept safe and secret before that. 
Besides, not every artifact is documented. But I'll give the critics this one. It does seem like something of this significance should have been discussed more, but I don't know. Again, I'm just laying out the facts that I can tell you with my measly little high school education. One last point from the Shroud Skeptics is that the linen itself is made in a herringbone pattern, not very typical of the Shrouds at the time, according to our archaeology. However, only so much fabric survives from the first century. We only have a dozen or so Shrouds, and we do know that the herringbone pattern was invented by the time of Jesus. So it's not impossible that it could have been used to bury him. They'll also point out that the Turin Shroud is much longer than most Shrouds supposedly were back then. In fact, it would have been almost twice the normal length. However, again, we have somewhere around a dozen examples of shrouds from this area in this time. A lot more than 12 people were buried in shrouds back in that day, so it's hardly a definitive sample size. But of course, just being skeptical of the anti-shroud arguments is not enough. We can't just accept some random shroud as a miraculous imprint of Jesus himself. Is there any real reason to accept the shroud as authentic? Well, the shroudy crowd sure think so. For starters, they'll easily point out just how amazing and seemingly miraculous the shroud is. There's not enough pigments to sufficiently explain the shroud with painting. To my knowledge, every attempted explanation has many challenges even from other shroud skeptics. Many people have tried to replicate the shroud using various medieval techniques, but they never are able to capture every detail. Luigi Garcelli was unable to produce the same detail and uniformity with acid pigmentation. Medieval photography would require a body to be sitting in the sunlight for months without deteriorating or moving, among other problems. N.D. Wilson's sun bleaching technique would indicate that the shroud should fade into the background as exposure equalizes the bleaching. The shroud is frequently displayed in bright sunlight for days at a time, however, and still no equalizing or bleaching has happened. The Milliard reaction, relief method, the dust transfer technique as well, they all fall short of producing certain aspects of the shroud. Many of these replicas have been impressive and convincing but there has not yet been one produced anywhere close to being completely identical in every major aspect. In order to show how the shroud was initially produced, you need to show a method that matches the qualities of the shroud in every way. Besides, any of these methods would be ridiculously elaborate. And for what? To produce a not very impressive, rather faint image. I mean, back then, a much more impressive visually miracle shroud could have been created by simply painting the linen. Sure, nowadays we could disprove such a thing as a fake easily by just zooming up with our little microscopes on the paint. But not back then. It's like whoever faked it was trying to get around our modern technological investigations, instead of just the relatively low bar of medieval inquiry. If the shroud is real, we still aren't really sure how it's formed. Whatever it was, it would have been some miraculous process that embedded an image of Jesus himself onto his burial clothes. A second point the shroud crowd is likely to throw out is the pollen. It has been shown that there are many varieties of pollen on the shroud, much of which appears to come from Judea, as opposed to the predominantly European pollen samples one might expect to see if the supposed medieval European origin story is true. Many scholars, however, object to this, arguing, and I quote, Such diversity in the pollen samples does not exclude a medieval origin in Europe, but it would also be compatible with the historic path followed by the Turin Shroud during its presumed journey from the Near East. Many Shroud skeptics argue that the pollen is due to the fact that many people from all over the world have come in contact with the Shroud. Maybe the pollen was brought to the Shroud instead of the Shroud being brought around the world. Another point in favor of the Shroud is X-ray dating. In an effort to use a less destructive method of dating, x-ray dating was used on the shroud. Long story short, they used x-rays to determine how much the linen had degraded to get a feel for how old it was. What they determined is that in order to match up with the medieval date so often given for the shroud, it would have had to be consistently kept at close to record-breaking temperatures. In contrast, in order to have been around 2,000 years old, the average temperature for the shroud's surroundings would have been somewhere around 21 degrees Celsius, or for my more patriotic audience, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, x-ray dating is a very new process, and not necessarily respected by every scientist, but there can be no doubt that these results are extremely interesting. Another point in the Shroud's favor is how insanely accurate it is of crucifixion. For example, the nails are positioned in the wrist, not the hand. Modern science has shown this to be the only feasible way for crucifixion to have actually worked, and historians have also shown that the Jews of Jesus' time would have considered the wrist as part of the hand, making the gospel accounts perfectly consistent. To our knowledge, though, medieval forgers would have had no idea about any of this, though, and most likely would have envisioned the nail wounds in the palms, like most especially early medieval art does. But one of the most amazing arguments for the shroud is the fact that many scientists have said they found blood on the shroud. Not only that, but it has been shown to be AB positive, which is the same blood type found on the Sudarium of Oviedo, which is another relic that is supposed to be the napkin 
put over Jesus' face in the burial, wrapped under the shroud. And it is also the blood type supposedly found in every Eucharistic miracle that has been tested. Furthermore, the DNA from the blood stains is most consistent with that of a male from the Middle East. One objection to the blood's authenticity, though, is that it's too red. 2,000-year-old blood should have dried black by now. Turns out, though, that there is quite a lot of bilirubin in the blood on the shroud. Bilirubin causes blood to stay red and is often produced during various extreme injuries and trauma. So in a way, that may be exactly what you'd expect on the shroud of a crucified person. Speaking of the Sudarium of Oviedo I mentioned, one of the most interesting arguments for the shroud's authenticity is its shocking alignment with the Sudarium. The artifact has a completely different official origin and dates back to at least the 6th century, if not further, but coincidentally lines up with the bloodstains and impressions, almost as if they were made from the same event. Finally, the image has a couple aspects that are really interesting and quite hard to explain if it's just some artist's creation. For one, the negative image is much more clear. In other words, if you make all the dark light and all the light dark, it's so much easier to make out, which is a really weird unintended aspect for an art project to have. Also, when put through a VPA analyzer, which turns dark and light into a 3D image, the image becomes basically a sculpture, which again is a really weird aspect for an art project to have. Normal art, for instance, put into one of these comes out something more like this. And finally, it lines up well with the crucifixion story of Jesus. If it's an authentic image of a crucified person, there can be no doubt that it is specifically that of Jesus. Its details show without a doubt a highly atypical crucifixion in many ways, one that lines up exactly with the narrative in the Gospels. The legs, for instance, aren't broken, which is very unusual. But if you'll remember, the Gospels specifically record and explain that. The bloodstains on his head are inconsistent with normal floggings, but perfectly match what you might expect if he was wearing, say, a crown of thorns. It also shows a wound on his side, consistent with the idea that he was speared before being removed. All in all, it shows not only the hands and feet pierced, but 372 individual wounds, consistent with the horrific narrative of intense, brutal beatings and floggings. The inhuman torture and humiliation that our Lord went through. If nothing else, this shroud is an incredible and touching reminder of what Jesus did for us, a bunch of depraved sinners. Even if it's not real, it's still an accurate and precious demonstration of the brutal, brutal torture and agony that Christ suffered so that we might become the sons of God. I hope you guys liked that video. I hope you liked it. I hope you subscribed and I hope you turned on notifications and left a couple comments down below. Let me know what you think. See you next time. God bless.